piggybacking on that, I would like to really hammer home this point that if you if you don't have some sort of spatial representation, right? That's why I wrote spatial up there. You don't want to use convolutional filters. So, like, if you were doing who who in our studio has used like the auto data set and it has like text like everybody used. <laughs> it has gas mileage and and like throttle size and wheel diameter. You would never want to use a convolutional neural network for that. The filters don't mean anything. There's no spatial dimension. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this picture up and we're just gonna to jump to quick other techniques, other kind of heuristics that people threw in before I go about answering the question so that we can fill in the missing pieces on this puzzle. So, radios and tan inches. Those are the exact same thing as that logistic function that we saw earlier. Those are just Gs. Those are inducing nonlinearities into your graph. A ReLU just takes anything less than zero and puts it to zero. That's a nonlinear operation. Pooling. Pooling means after the filters have slid across, just group nearby activations. You can either group them by taking the average, that'd be average pooling, or you can group them by taking the maximum, and that would be maximum pooling. What do you mean by activation? Yeah. Can everybody see the board over here? Is it too? Should I do it over there? It's okay. And this will kind of be hitting at kind of hitting at your question just to make this idea of an activation a little bit clearer. If we had a, a genomic sequence and we one hot encoded it so that the rows now represent nucleotides and it's just binary so that if we had an A in the first position we'd have a one in the A row and zero, zero, zero. And if the next letter was a C, we have a one in our C row, and zero, zero, zero. And you can encode your entire sequence in this manner, right? And it's just one to one, finite idea. Now, if you then take your convolutional filter, it's gonna sit on this matrix, this four by L matrix, and it's gonna slide across. At each position, it's going to be computing the product, the inner product, between all of the omegas here and whatever one hot representation of the sequence is right there. So this filter says length 16, and the entire sequence will say is length 32. So the first time this filter is sitting on this observation, it would be sitting on the first half. And then it could slide over one spot, and then one spot, one spot, one spot, one spot, right? Each time it's sitting in a spot, it computes probably the ugliest formula you'll see today. It computes the weights times that one half vector representation and sums it over the entire filter. So the filter is sitting down there, we take the weights times the one halves. Sum it all up. That's going to give us a new vector. This position is going to contain the value of this filter multiplied with this observation position. And it's going to contain a single value. That single value is called an activation. So it's like taking the weights and multiplying it to the observation, and that's called an activation. So pooling then was combining nearby elements by either taking the max or the average. And by nearby, you just mean like assuming that in the nucleotide sequence, the first position A and the second position C, or nearby in another more abstract way? Just one tiny more step abstract. 
Yes, yes, in the original representation of the sequence, position one indicated an A and position two indicated a C. However, after we've taken this inner product and, and summed over all four nucleotides, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond to an A being here. It corresponds to just some value. So yes, combining those values. <laughs> Um, okay, so that was nonlinearity, pooling. I talked about dropout real quick. Dropout then would be just randomly dropping out or removing the weights associated with various multiplications thrown in. Just throwing them away for for a training path. So so you would just throw away all the weights or half the weights, pump your observation through the network, and then update the parameters, like we saw with those iterative methods, back propagation. However, you would only be updating about half of them. It's just throwing away weights. Uh, batch normalization and residual networks we're going to uh, skip, but there are other things that work really, really well. Is that just to get a more accurate, the dropout, is that just to get a more accurate overall probability, or is there a easier so, so it's a very good question. Dropout, dropout works from a regularization viewpoint. So saying um, you don't want to overfit. So saying if we, if we train with half of the network, we run lower risk of overfitting because we're only ever seeing half the network, right? Randomly halves. So like at the end, the entire network's trained, but you've only ever seen half of it at a time. There is some really cool statistical underpinnings to drop out. Um, if anybody's interested, I would check out Gall, uh, Yarn Gall's work, GAL. It's very, very cool. You can show that it's approximate Bayesian inference doing drop out. Um, but that's too much to talk about today. Okay, so we saw those filters tacked on to our big compositional functions allows us to recover spatial heat. Can you say like one sentence about how it's Bayesian? If you don't mind. Yeah, so if you do this, and then each time you drop out, it's akin to dropping these out with a Bernoulli probability. And then pumping these through multiple, multiple, multiple times, each time drying and covering each time, will approximate the posterior distribution, your predicted posterior distribution, so piece of y given omega x and everything else. Uh, through variational dates. So do you, all you do is tons and tons of Bernoulli draws pass through the same observation a ton of times, and now you have uncertainty around an observation where it represents posterior distribution. So you get a predictive distribution. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we saw those spatial features. Now I'm not going to talk much about this, but I did want to just throw it out there so you can say you heard it. What about sequential features? What if we know that there's like A before it comes before C and C before it comes before T? Or we know that this is a sentence and each of these is a word, the cat jumped over the fence, whatever. How do you incorporate that information? That's called a recurrent neural network. Uh, so instead of taking the entire observation at one point and pushing it through, you're taking one element of the observation and pushing it through one at a time. So the model will only see this nucleotide at this point, and then you get up here, and then the information from C would come into this state. It's very, very similar to the hidden Markov model stuff you guys did. This is not popular in genomics yet, and it's very difficult to fit these sorts of models, recurrent neural networks. They are popular in sentence modeling because like the output at each time will be the, if this is a sentence, it would be the most likely word to come next, for example. Um, but I want the message about these I want to hammer home is that it's sequential. So there is a sequential parallel analog to the um, spatial filters. However, it's super difficult to fit. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to switch gears completely to genomics. 
So what makes it easier for sentences to be fit than for nucleotides? There's more signal, there's more diversity. Nucleotides, you have four options. So it's really tough. You'd have to have generally these nodes, I'm gonna call them, are represented with are composed of gates. So if you've heard of the LSTM recurrent neural network, that would mean that each of these has four gates, four, four omegas, doing a different thing. One gate's going to take the input. One gate's going to remember the previous state. One gate's going to know what to forget. And one gate is going to try to decipher all those, those three other things and put them together. Because you have like four gates in the most popular architecture and only four nucleotides, there's four to the four possibilities. But there are way more possibilities of what you want to actually learn. So you can't learn those things. Cool. Uh, any other questions quick before we jump fully into genomics? Cool. OK. Going back to what we talked about in like lab number seven when we did this, we simulated reads. And we had some outcome variable denoting whether the read contained a certain sequence. Okay. Here I'm showing the tall one motif. And observations corresponding to y equal to 1 would be just those observations that I simulated to come from this distribution. Note that. Some sequences will actually have A, C, A, G, A, T, and B, Y equals 1. Some other sequences will actually be C, A, G, G, T. Right? There's a non-zero probability. This is a distribution of sequences. Not every sequence will look exactly the same. Okay. And then we have as many sequences that do not come from this distribution. They come from a different distribution of sequences. And the goal is to train a deep neural network, deep convolutional filter, to predict if the sequence has the motif. If, if you are in a simple logistic regression framework and you knew the sequence and the motif, you could define a predictor saying, does the sequence have C, A, G, A, T? And then fit a logistic regression model to that feature. And your model would do very, very well, right? By construction, by how I simulated this. However, we're not going to define such an obvious feature. We're going to see if we can learn it. Can those filters, those convolutional filters, learn this distribution, or this pattern. Put this up here quickly. Data such as, as the simulation could come from peaks that you call with max. Say you have an experiment, and you call chip seek peaks. So now you have 50,000 sequences. And those sequences contain motifs. We know that, right? You guys saw that from data. How can we try to learn those motifs? Okay, so that's the problem setup. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We're going to define some risk function. This would just be logistic loss because the y's are just 0 or 1. So it's very, very simple. This is the same thing you'd be doing with logistic regression, the same loss. Yeah. So it's known which ones have a motif and which don't. The y's yes. are known. Exactly. That is what we're trying to predict. Yeah, I'm not sure what the x's are. Are they the sequence? Oh, okay. 100, let's just say hypothetically, 100 base pair long sequence. Somewhere in that sequence, if it's a positive one, somewhere in that sequence is a sequence, subsequence, 
drawn from this distribution. Somewhere in those hundred movie times. Right. Got it. So it's a fixed length sequence all the way down. Yeah. It doesn't need to be fixed length, but yeah, for simplicity we'll say so. And then we define some loss function. And then here I'm just putting up what we saw earlier, some deep network that we're gonna fit. Right? These layers, or the layers correspond to the compositions as we saw before. And then we're just going to say the first layer needs to be a convolutional layer. Don't worry about the math. You will, never, you will not be tested on any math on the exam, but that's how you write a convolutional filter if you want. So we've defined our model loss, and the model would look like this. Okay. Yes? So this is sort of a basic question. As far as trying to predict, when we say that we're trying to predict it, are we using something else to define what we're predicting? Like, like um, how are we categorizing the 100 base pairs of sequences? Are we looking for a category of the sequences, or? Not that hard. So we have our X matrix. I think two slides ago I wrote it as S. It doesn't really matter. In the back of your mind, this matrix would have n observations. Um, I'm going to draw that in there for now. It'll become obvious later why. And each of these observations is the sequence. So a, b, c, d, g, da, da, da. And then same thing down here. And then corresponding to that, we have the labels. So I'm going to, this would be y, and I'm going to write it very simply as a match. Right? All of these are ones, all of these are zeros. So all of the sequences that have one contain some, some subsequence similar to this. So I could have my C A G A T. And this sequence, we're going to pass our convolutional filters over. Because we don't know where the actual motif is. The sequence is corresponding to y equals 0, would never contain this motif. And so earlier I said, if we could define a feature in logistic regression that said, does this sequence exist, we would have nearly perfect accuracy predicting. Right? It'd be super easy if you knew, like, like it's trivial, right? It's just how I'm saying it. It's like if you knew the sequence existed, you already know what the y equals one. So it'd be perfect correspondence. But we don't know that the sequence exists. So this would be like most of findings. Bingo. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You can you can like almost think that you don't know. So do you know which ones are one, which ones are zero? Because I simulated, yes. Yeah. In real life, no. So you, you don't have that distribution beforehand. Right. I want to learn that distribution. And it's distribution of weights. So pictorially, what I put on the last two slides in the math was that we have some network consisting of four layers. We're going to predict a binary label, and we're going to have convolutional filters at front, and then we're going to fit this model for several epochs. So an epoch is one entire, it's seen the entire set of training data once. And then we're going to just obtain model weights, so extract the weights out of the model once we found a model with the lowest test set values. Seems like this picture doesn't actually get drawn enough, and it's very, very, very important. Okay, x-axis, I'm going to be putting iteration. Earlier, when I said logistic regression has no closed form solution, we must use an iterable method, like Newton Raps. This could be gradient descent, right? Iterations of gradient descent. So steps you're taking of that ball rolling down some concave slope. Along the y-axis, I'm going to have error. What is my error? My error is calculated by 
bit. There's a formula for it. The formula takes into account the true labels, and it takes into account my predicted labels. Yeah, it's just a number. So for each, each iteration, right, I want to minimize that error. So for each iteration, we expect the error to go down, right? That's logical. We want to minimize the error. We're taking gradients of some steps to minimize that error. So we might have a picture like this. It's never going to go to zero. Right? Most likely. It's going to start high and it's going to go down as we have more iterations. Okay? Now this is my training data. So this means what the model has seen and what my model has updated its parameters with. I also, best practice, would keep some observations off to the side, right? A test set. I would never show that to my model. But if I did calculate the loss on that test set, I would probably have a picture very similar to this, right? Early on, my test set loss is going to be decreasing. And it's going to be probably more than my training set loss because it's never seen those observations. So we're going to keep decreasing, 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 decreasing. At some point, my model is going to have learned too much. It's going to overfit. In machine learning, this is a huge problem. When you have more features or more weights than you have observations. You can learn too much and overfit. At the point of overfitting, that means my test set error is no longer going to be decreasing. I will overfit on the training error, and my test set error will start to come back up. This is known. When I say I want to take the weights from the iteration with the lowest test set accuracy, I'm saying, oh, we take weights from, what is this, iteration 10 million, whatever. We would extract the model from this point. We would not take the model way over here. It's too overfit. Okay. So I say we define our risk, we've defined our model architecture, and then we train. Minimizing error, and we obtain a model. We obtain all of these millions of weights. Yeah? So if we're doing this low key finding and we don't know the low key, how do we actually generate training data? Um, we're just going to, I'll come try to come back to that at the end. Um, it would be like chipseed data. You could do chipseed data versus random genome background. Then how can we tell it? One is zero, one is one. Like how can it figure out? I, so, so if I took a chip seek experiment and called peaks with max, I could say that those are all y equals one. And then I could take random genome background from like non-coding regions and say all of those are y equals zero. Then I have labels. And then I do the train. Okay. So now we have all these weights. But kind of getting to her question, we don't know what those weights mean. In regression, you know what those weights mean, right? People spend tons of time studying this. That's what causal inference is. Saying, oh, this weight is the causal effect of giving a placebo to someone with a disease. Here, we have millions of weights, and they don't correspond to that. It's not just like an average, like in OLS. Right? To even hammer that home, think about it in ordinary least squares, the model I started with, y equals x beta. Those epidemiologists out there would say that each beta is like an average treatment event. It's the, it's the average, change in the average. Now, let's think about logistic regression. Each omega in logistic regression is a odds ratio. Log ratio, right? Already you can see that interpretation gets 
changed because we've introduced that single noun in the area, that single G. Here, we've stacked 10 Gs together and taken the composition. There's no interpretation for our parameters. And that's why computer scientists work on these problems and statisticians don't. But that being said, we can still try to learn or try to figure out what your weights are like. One, one way to do that would be by imposing some sort of penalty to encourage interpretability in your weights. Those of you who have heard of lasso or ridge regression or elastic net, that's what L1, L2 regularization is. You're encouraging interpretability by pushing weights to zero. We're not going to spend much time on this in deep learning. These techniques in deep learning are imposed for more heuristic reasons, to avoid overfitting, to be precise. However, once you've trained your model, you can interpret the weights via two methods, two broad methods. The first would be a forward method, and they're, they're the simplest ones, and that's what we're going to focus on. The second are the backwards methods, the gradient-based methods. And these are a bit newer. They kind of started coming out in 2016, 2017. And I would be happy to provide more resources. Um, these citations that I've included in the end of the slideshow will be great. Um, there's a lot of work in this direction right now. So um, if this sort of thing is interesting, I would definitely take a look at those things. But we're going to focus on forward methods, so forward-based methods. And to do that, we're going to turn to the first paper that came out applying CNNs to genomics. So this was out of Princeton, this was uh, Troyanskaya and Zhu, and essentially they, they were the first to the punch for training these, these networks. Was, they trained what's called deep seeding, and then to interpret what their model learns, they use these forward-based methods. So if we wanted to answer the question I posed here, how important is having an A in the fifth position of your sequence in contributing to your final prediction? How would you go about answering that? Well, what they did here was, for a given observation, pumped it through the network, right? So that's just matrix multiplications forward, and you obtain a single value. That would be a probability, right? Then modify just a single nucleotide in the sequence. Switch the fifth A to a C. You might even think, oh, what would be like a sequence that exists on some promoter? And then what's a, a, a SNP that's been called significant? Let's, let's do it with some, some meaningful SNP, right? Obtain a new prediction for the new sequence and take the difference. Right, so it's a difference in predicted probability based on just swapping one value. So you kind of try to say, oh, what has my model learned? Well, it's learned that an A in the, this position is very important for obtaining a prediction, whereas a C, uh, the, the probability of being a positive outcome goes way down. So that's what I'm showing here. This is their figure one. If you had sequences and you mutated a single nucleotide, push it through your network, and obtain differences in the probability of bonding, of binding, sorry, or the difference in probability of being a positive outcome, and you do that genome wide, you can find which variants in the genome are are significant, right? Which ones are meaningful? That's exactly what they did here. This would be a graphical representation of that. A little bit. This came out in the Al Naki paper, which would be the second paper um, kind of coming out in the field. It was right on the heels of the first one. And they show it graphically here. So if this is your normal 
This is your normal sequence. You can change each of these nucleotides to another nucleotide and obtain a prediction each time. That would be a 4 by L now. And then the colors indicate the difference between the predictions. And the height is just the uh, absolute value of the color. So the height is some magnitude of the color, right? And then I'll overlay are stars indicating GWAS implicated SNPs. Right? So SNPs that have been found in the GWAS study to be meaningful to disease. And the authors note that look, like around these GWAS implicated SNPs, your model is more sensitive to those, those nucleotides. So you're interpreting what, they, what you learn by changing each nucleotide, giving a new prediction, and basically plotting it. And you could do this for every sequence. You could do this for sequences your biological collaborators says are important for your study. And gives you some, some sense of how important a given nucleotide is for the output prediction. Okay. Getting back to the more important question now. So that was kind of a, a primer to get you thinking about how you might do, uh, might learn what your model is seeing, like looking at differences between activations. The second big interpretation that came out in the Alpinaki paper and then coming out a little bit later in the uh, Bassett-Kelly paper was this idea that your filters learn the motif. So, again, you've trained your model, and now you take those filters on the first layer, and you extract all of the weights. Then, filter by filter, so for example, you could have 100 filters, you obtain, you extract the sequences which maximize that filter. So each filter, right, being slid across a given sequence. If when it's at position X has a very, very high value, let's grab that sequence. By activation? Yes. What sort of things are we going to predict? Sorry, what? What sort of things are we going to predict? Uh, we're just predicting if it has the motif or not for this simple case. Uh, this, this technique came out for uh, with Bassett, in which they were trying to predict which cell the, the reads belong to. So instead of, that's, that's a good point, I was meant to that. So instead of this being binary, 0 or 1, in that Bassett paper I mentioned, you have 64, 164 outcome outcomes. Each outcome corresponds to a different cell type. So you'd be trying to learn the the profile, the sequence profile of each cell. Did there ever be like a regression? Huh? Did there ever be like a regression purpose? Of... Did you say regression purpose? Yeah, did there ever be like a reason to use regression? Like, as your loss? As your like, like instead of having a multi-class of the output, like having a, like a... Like a scalar? Yeah. And trying to match it? Yeah. Um, not in that setting where you're trying to predict disjoint things. Yeah. But you could definitely have, and they do, actually that's another good, good point, they do in the Alvinaki paper, instead of modeling like a discrete outcome, like cell type or what I did here would be discrete, right, this zero or one, they model an intensity. So then they do square loss. Okay. So, the cool finding was that if you extract those first layer filters, pass test set observations or just observations, it doesn't matter, pass observations through that first layer, extract just the sequences that have a high activation value. So extract just the sequences that that single filter gets turned on by. Each of those extracted sequences will be the, will take the length of a single motif filter, 
hypothetically in our example, these are our filters are 16 base pairs long. So we'll extract 16 base pair sequences surrounding the highest activation value per sequence. And then use those sequences to compute a PWM. That last step is super simple, right? Just calculate the frequency of each letter in each position and plot that. What they found was that many filters learn previously found motifs. In our example, now my computer I can't hold up. In our example, we would be learning this motif. If you guys want to come see my computer screen afterwards, I will show you an example just before class where I did this. It took about 10 minutes to train my network and learn this. And I had I trained with 16 filters, and about eight of them learned this. It's exact pattern. What did the other ones learn? Good question. Uh, I have no good answer for you. Um, I like. I think they learned noise. But you said eight of them all learned this sequence. And the other ones learned, like, there might be one that just had, like, a T, like, pretty high right here. Yeah. How are you learning? What the huh? How are you visualizing what the learning is? In the simplest way possible, in which I take the sequences that activate a given filter, extract 16 base pairs around that, and just compute collapse down to a PWM. Uh, subtracting genome background, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and going on to your question, I'm going to pop up this guy. Here's from the Kelly paper, the Bassett model. Remember predicting lots of different cell types. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven filters that significantly aligns to this known CTCF motif. And you can see there's this sliding nature, right? It's even more evident on this one, right? Like, like this one captured some of it. This one captured like some of it over here. What if you just constrain it so that there's only one filter? And will it do a better job of not like splitting up the motif among all these different filters? In this example, it will do a better job of learning the single motif. However, in now what if I had a different experiment that I just did the other day? Now you have two motifs inserted. Now your accuracy will be at most, what, like 25, 30%? Because you'll never be able to learn that other filter, essentially, right? Or it'll learn like some combination. Um, and then to get like the filters which match a known filter, you can use software. So it's just called TomTom. Tom. So I did brush that under the rug here, how they said these are significant. But they said these are significant. Uh, statistically significant to that one via some other method, right? Um, but also, like a lot of the times, to, to address that number of filters question, you're more interested in accuracy. And so people use deep learning because it's super accurate. Think about autonomous cars, right? You want 99.999% accuracy. So you probably want like 100 filters. You know, if you can learn that signal, one filter, you might, your accuracy might hover about 75. And why you can use a filter then? Why not use like just logistic regression, which now you have very interpretable measures from. So oftentimes in simpler tasks where they care more about what you're learning, they would kind of do a KMER approach and then SVM. So KMER means they would take a sequence and break it into all say three MERS, so every possible combination of three nucleotides, and take all the counts of that in the sequence and then just pass it through an SVM. And that was like the pre-deep learning era. It worked pretty well. Deep learning had much better accuracy at the cost of interpretation. 
Yeah, are there numbers and the accuracy of like SVM and then deep before SVM and like that and then to the Markov models or something? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, do you have numbers on the accuracy scores between the different stages of like, deep learning and SVMs and then other methods? Yeah, so for that, I look at challenges. So Dream Challenge is a really good one. PR AM. Dream 5? I think it's Dream 5. And so in that, it's basically um, it's a Kaggle competition, right? And that's where these models were originated. So basically, one big Kaggle competition, competition who can predict the best. And I guess, you know, SVM was out there probably like 82%. I think this was like 98 3 to 94 percent for Bassett is what I'm showing. Um, but yeah, you can definitely look up numbers on all those, and they're just like public scoring things. Okay, we got 10 minutes left. I was going to jump into conclusion, summary, and questions, unless there's anything else you guys have put in. Okay. Okay, take home messages. Math is important. Uh, so, right, so the change in model predictions is one way to learn what your model is doing. A second one is that these filters tend to learn meaningful patterns. And that's true in image analysis as well. You kind of see like, oh, this filter kind of captures an ear of a dog. And this one kind of captures the paw of a cat. So it's the one-to-one -one between those is very, very meaningful. It's very cool, and that was a big finding in genomics. These uh, interpretations are largely visualization based. There's no, you know, 95% uh, confidence intervals or anything. You can't say with any sort of theoretical backing what you learned. That's why people prefer statistics for many things. And models are typically trained on, say, chip seek data or protein binding microarray data. And you could pre, uh, be predicting where the data came from, either cell or it came from your experiment versus background. Importantly, they have high accuracy and sensitivity. However, fitting is very difficult. Right? So it takes a long time. We saw there's tons of different parameters and options you can set, how many filters, how many weights. So learning rate, everything. SVMs, you basically got two parameters. Um, and on top of that, interpretations are very, very difficult to make. I put up the first three papers that came into the field. So that was Deep C, one from Princeton, that was Deep Find, the Alphanati paper at UNS Toronto. And then the last one was Bassett. Uh, came out of a brother, uh, Kelly. And, but since then, there's been a ton of work, right? So at the end, you can find lots of sources. But like if you're on an archive, you'll probably find something related to this like twice a week coming out in preprint form. It's a very active field. There's a lot of work being made on the interpretations especially with those backpropagation methods, which I didn't discuss. There's a lot with architectures. So architectures would be like the number of filters or how the filters interact or imposing some constraints upon your network such that it learns reverse uh, the reverse complement sequence just like it learns the normal sequence, right? So try to impose some constraints to get interpretability. Um, and then applications. So there are more applications that I haven't really touched on. I'll pop up a slide in a second. Um, and we've kind of only talked about like the application of chips. Um, deep learning is definitely the best for image analysis. It's not there yet for genomics. So I'm usually hesitant to try to say like, hey, this is you know what you should go work on for five years for your dissertation because it hasn't had the success that image analysis has. So generally it's easier to do learn deep learning on something like image analysis um, rather than trying to kind of muck through some of the early development of it on genomics. Um, but it's a, it's a great field, that being said. 
Uh, I think this is the last slide. Some extensions that I didn't really get to chat about. Um, I could give you papers on these if you're interested. There really aren't very many for most of them yet. We talked about epigenetics today. So, nothing like Gypsy, right? Here. Um, the, the other one that I've kind of seen stuff come up, coming up is alternative splicing. Um, this is where you start to get into the recurrent neural networks. How is a gene going to be spliced differently? I have like three, three things I've seen come out in that realm. Model interpretability is huge, what I touched on before. There's a lot of work being done. Um, Fudahi's lab, Stanford, is doing a lot here. I think you guys have heard that name in this course multiple times. Um, so that's out of Stanford, they're doing a lot there. Population genetics, just read, saw one paper come out the other day. Uh, it's kind of a silly paper because I think, you know, like all they're trying to do is throw a very deep architecture at something that might be just fine with something like uh, last order regression. Uh, single cell RNA seq has seen a little bit more. Um, there's a couple papers coming out in that direction. Um, and then the last thing that's really, really cool are GANs. Uh, they're called generative adversarial networks. Um, kind of, they're used for like image demoising um, or in genomics. They're used for generating ideal sequences. So let's say you were designing a microarray probe. You could try to design like a designer sequence that would have a higher affinity for binding without contamination to the sequences that you care about. So those are GANs. It's a big field right now as well. Cool. Uh, so that's all I got for you guys. If you got questions or anything, I'm happy to chat afterwards.